I would like to hand over to Maria Larea, who is with us today. She's the head of unit for food security and environment at the Foreign Ministry of Spain and also the platform Focal Point for Spain and member of the platform board. Welcome, Maria. We're happy to have you here and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining this uh, virtual conference. Well, I think you may all know very well David Navarro is the special representative of the UN Secretary General for Food Security and Nutrition. Um, he participates very actively at uh, all foreign international discussions concerning food security and nutrition. And by the way, uh, he participated recently, uh, for example, at the last CFS session. Um, the Zero Hunger Challenge was launched by the UN Secretary General at the Rio Plus 20 event in June this year and it was uh, presented to the platform in July by David Navarro. Um, following up uh, on this presentation, now David Navarro comes back to follow up uh, with a new role outline for the talent. Um, as you all know, one of the main proposals of the platform is to coordinate all different actors involved in food security and align actions and approaches. So uh, this is an opportunity to seek uh, for potentials for alignment with, with the five pillars of the talent. So, um, David, it's over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Maria. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to thank the Secretariat of the platform, not just for making this session possible, but also for setting it up with WebEx and the quality of the arrangements. Uh, this is great. Uh, this is, uh, uh, there was the first briefing on the Zero Hunger Challenge in which I took part by telephone on July, in July this year, and now we've got the follow-up meeting today. And there's a lot to talk about, and I, I would like to do a little bit of background, especially for those of you who don't know uh, my role and who do, don't have too much uh, information about what's going on. I will do that quickly and then go into where we are on the Zero Hunger Challenge and uh, look ahead to some of the key events that are coming up in the future both globally and also in regions. If we just start with the, the latest State of Food Insecurity in the World Report that was released in October this year, the current figure is, for the numbers of people who are chronically hungry in the world today is 870 million, and that's one in eight. Now, many of you will know that this represents a significant drop from the estimates in 2010 and 2011. I have to be clear that this drop is pretty much a result of improved methodologies that uh, the member states have asked FAO to put in place over a number of years. And it's not, unfortunately, true to say that this represents a major success in the efforts to reduce hunger. The reason for why I'm quite disturbed about this number is given the improved methodologies, it's actually still a, a remarkably high number. We'd often thought that the billion or 950 uh, uh, million figures that were around were a bit inflated because of problems with calculations and so on. But now it's quite clear that this new and revised figure is still really quite high. And it's certainly far higher than most world leaders consider to be tolerable. Now, uh, Graziano, uh, Graziano da Silva, the Director General of FAO says very clearly that from his perspective when talking about hunger, the only acceptable number is zero. And we've got similar positions being taken by an increasing number of leaders who believe that to talk in terms of halving uh, or any other multiple is really not appropriate given that this hunger in, from any point of analysis should be something that is just not present. I'm not here talking about intermittent periods of hunger. We're here talking about chronic long-term hunger lasting over many months. Perhaps it's useful just to recap on some of the issues around uh, hunger and food security. Firstly, uh, there is a little bit of concern in the agencies, uh, WFP, FAO, EFAD and others, that we've not been precise enough with language. Uh, I've, it's been very precise here that these are 870 million people who are chronically hungry. Probably the number who are food insecure, assessed using the current definitions of food insecurity, is greater than that. And the number that's undernourished is also 
uh, probably different and may well be greater, especially when micronutrient malnutrition is included. And so there's work underway right now to further analyze what the, uh, what the state of play is on food insecurity and undernutrition. And I'll be very pleased to keep you informed about how that work is progressing. I think we have been in a different world on food security in post-2008 than we were beforehand because it was the rise of food prices in 2008 that really did lead to a much greater political focus on food insecurity and on poor nutrition and on the structural failings of world food systems, uh, not just uh, in um, very poor countries, but actually right across the world. Uh, that led the high-level task force to be set up by the UN Secretary General, 23 different agencies and organizations, and they've been meeting at intervals. They've now had to over to, uh, 22 formal meetings to uh, analyze the situation and to come out with a number of common positions and uh, policy actions. Their first step was to develop a comprehensive framework for action on food and nutrition security in 2008, to revise it in 2010, summarize it in 2011, uh, and to find that this still holds good uh, as an appropriate way to address the four dimensions of food insecurity with a twin track and comprehensive response. The volatility of food prices uh, was one of uh, concern that grew during the period, particularly 2009 to 2011. And it was a subject that, that the French government took on in their presidency of the G20, uh, really in, with work up uh, during 2010 and then major dialogue of a political nature during 2011. Members of the high level task force contributed to the report that was considered by the G20. We believe that the analysis in that report is still relevant, especially as food price volatility continues and is much in the news even today. It's an issue that I'm sure that the global donor platform will want to go on focusing on. Governance of food and nutrition security came into prominence really following the work in 2008 with members of the G8 and other bodies calling for a new global partnership on this uh, subject. And then in 2009, the plan was laid during a, a summit on world food uh, security for a revitalization of the Committee on Food Security. This was launched in its new form in 2010 and then has had now had its second, sorry, its third meeting in its new form in 2012. Uh, I'm going to talk for a little bit about the Committee on Food Security because I believe that it has reshaped a lot of our thinking and has provided a new environment for our working. Firstly, I think it's meant that all of us now see the right to food as an underpinning uh, framework for analysis and accountability for all work on food security. Uh, the emphasis in the Committee on Food Security on small and family farms is one that is now well embedded. Concerns about unilateral trade restrictions and uh, unfair trading practices are frequently expressed in the CFS, though members of the CFS are particularly nervous about it actually embarking on dialogue and uh, negotiation around trade issues, believing that these are best left with the World Trade Organization. The CFS has been concerned on food price volatility with the role of excessive financial speculation on food commodities. Uh, it's also been increasingly involved in looking at issues around climate change and will start to examine uh, the mandates for conversion of food crops to biofuels. My reason for mentioning this is that CFS is actually taking on issues that have hitherto been quite tricky within the normal governance mechanisms for food security. Personally, I think this is very good. It is in part result of the multi-stakeholder nature of the CFS. And our analysis is that in the 2012 meeting, we were seeing this multi-stakeholder governance showing new maturity and really come into its own. It will be interesting to see whether this way of working is sustained uh, as the really uh, excellent work on voluntary guidelines for tenure of land and other resources are put into practice, negotiations on responsible agriculture, uh, agriculture investment are taken forward, and the quite important work in the CFS on how to respond to protracted food insecurity crises is also uh, put into play. 
the CFS's global strategic framework was agreed. We're delighted to see this and we find that much of what's in the current uh, comprehensive framework for action finds uh, itself in the global strategic framework and we will continue to ensure that there is consonance between what happens in the governance structure and what happens across the UN. Within the CFS and within agencies of the uh, high level task force, as we work with governments, we see one really um, important trend, which is an interest in how can the private sector contribute to more sustainable and less volatile uh, agricultural and food systems that do bring benefits to smallholders and reduce uh, food insecurity and improve nutrition in the longer term. This is a tricky area. Many governments want to get stronger private sector engagement in their ag and food systems. We heard this throughout the CFS. Uh, there is a, a, a substantive private sector representation in the CFS. A number of donor agencies are looking at ways to support the public-private partnerships that respect the right to food and also empower smallholders and family farms. But still, there is some suspicion as to whether or not this increased private sector involvement will lead to respect for the voluntary guidelines and also for the right to food. Uh, this is something that not only the CFS, but I think all of us will wish to work on. During the work this year on food security that was taken into negotiations for the Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development, uh, we saw that the effort within the CFS and the involvement of a variety of stakeholders on food security was very strong and that the poverty focus was, was great with the right to food. At the same, at the same time, we were also seeing uh, governments concerned about how to bring environmental and sustainability considerations into their work on food security. There was, for a period of time earlier on in this year, as I said in my last briefing, a degree of dis, uh, discordance between the G77 group supported by many emerging nations who were saying, look, this is just not fair that you've shifted to a focus on sustainability when we want a continuation of, in, of involvement in uh, poverty elimination. And the Secretary General asked us to develop a way of thinking about food security that would link together sustainability considerations and uh, the issues around access to food and uh, reducing food insecurity. And that was what led to the Zero Hunger Challenge with its focus on everybody having access to nutritious food, no child suffering the hidden tragedy of stunting, all food systems to be sustainable, uh, what, doing what we can to double the productivity and income of smallholders especially women, and no food being lost or wasted. This was developed as an advocacy tool. It was given a soft release at the uh, Rio Plus 20 event uh, on the 21st of June. The idea was not to promote it as a very strong campaigning slogan by the Secretary General of the UN, because he believed that many others are working on the different elements of the Zero Hunger Challenge, and he wanted them to decide how they wanted to take forward, particularly governments. And at the Secretary General's request, we've been uh, embedding this within the work of the High Level Task Force. Uh, indeed, it was agreed on June the 27th, this will be at the heart of the work of the High Level Task Force. We've been developing uh, advocacy materials around the Zero Hunger Challenge, not going much further than the original literature that was released uh, on June the 21st, but making sure that that's widely available. Ensuring that there are agencies taking forward different elements of the challenge, starting with the, um, 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 the work by FAO, particularly on loss or waste of food, the work by IFAD on smallholders, uh, the work by the Scale-Up Nutrition Movement on reducing stunting, and the work by WFP on access to adequate food all year round. FAO and UNEP, we anticipate, will work on ensuring that we have appropriate analyses for sustainable food systems. But most importantly, this Zero Hunger Challenge uh, vision is now being made available to governments and repeated by the Secretary General uh, as they are looking at what we call, refer to inside uh, the UN as the post-MDG agenda or the post-2015 agenda and what member states refer to as developing sustainable development goals. There are at least three processes underway. One is a UN system-wide process led by UNDP with a variety of thematic consultations plus country consultations to identify appropriate elements which could form the basis of sustainable development goals. We anticipate, and I hope I'm not out of order in mentioning this, 
that there will be a thematic meeting on hunger, food and nutrition security in Madrid in March next year, preceded hopefully by a dialogue within the Committee on Food Security in February, uh, based in Rome. That still has to be worked through, uh, and uh, I anticipate there will be some uh, political action necessary to set that up. Second track is work by a high-level panel on uh, looking at the experience with the Millennium Development Goals and applying that to the post-2015 environment. The panel is chaired by UK, Indonesia, and Liberia. There's a secretariat being set up to, to, to run it. Uh, there's a special envoy of the Secretary General, uh, I mean, uh, Amina Mohamed al Zubair, who is uh, leading on this, and also uh, this work is quite well advanced. Then there's a third track, which is an open ended panel of member states, 30 of them, who will be working on this issue. The member states have now identified themselves. The first two strands of work are likely to be completed by September 2013 for a major event during the UN General Assembly. The uh, open ended panel will take uh, open ended working group of member states will take longer. The Zero Hunger Challenge is designed to help inform these different groups so that they can bring together the different aspects of sustainability, uh, hunger, food and nutrition security as they're doing their work. The Zero Hunger Challenge is backed by social media campaigns, a website, Twitter accounts and Facebook. The links were shared with the invitation. The agencies will continue to work actively on it and together with different high level task force member agencies, uh, my team in the uh, coordination unit for the high level task force will do our best to ensure that this serves as a reasonable platform for transforming into action committed commitments that were made in Rio plus 20. So in conclusion, we uh, together with a number of governments, particularly some of those who were talking in the second committee of the United Nations yesterday in New York, see the zero hunger challenge as representing a new era in which issues of food and nutrition security are put into the context of sustainability. We hope that this will prove useful to all concerned as they work out how they're going to position themselves in the work leading up to the uh, to 2015 and also in the post-2015 environment. I think all of us do believe that hunger can be ended within our lifetimes, that hunger should be ended within our lifetimes, and that therefore this is time to rededicate it our commitments to the cause of ending hunger and malnutrition through sustainable agriculture and food systems linked up to the other nutrition sensitive development actions that are necessary. So that's the uh, opening remarks from our side. Uh, I'd like to stop now and uh, I hope that uh, what I said was intelligible to you. Uh, look forward to comments on it. Thanks again, Chris. Okay, thank you very much, David, for uh, explaining the background, the framework, objectives and the next steps of the Zero Hunger Challenge to us in such a short time. Keith, you would like to ask a question, so over to you, Keith. I'm at the um, Natural Resources Institute, which is uh, part of the uh, Un University of Greenwich in the UK. Um, I want to just sort of make a point really, but I think that with this Zero Hunger Challenge, um, one of the important issues, I think, also is actually try and get people to diversify away from the durables like maize and wheat, rice, etc. And a lot of my work actually is now on root and tuber crops. And um, actually, if you look in developing countries, 2.2 billion people in developing countries in the world consume um, root and tuber crops. And we're talking about here about yam, uh, cassava, and um, sweet potato. I'm only mentioning these because these are actually um, very good food security crops because when, the, um, when you have global um, food uh, rises in food prices and when there's shortages of main durables, often people can rely on root and tuber crops as an alternative. So I'm simply just making that, um, that uh, suggestion that maybe perhaps we need to consider um, root and tuber crops and other uh, commodities which people can use as um, alternatives in food security at difficult times. And I'd be interested to know what other people's uh, views would be about that, please. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, actually, I have been talking a lot with uh, Graziano da Silva about this particular issue. And he is extremely keen that we take advantage of 
the thinking around the Zero Hunger Challenge to uh, look at alternative sources of, of energy. And, and so he would agree with what Keith has just said about the value of roots and tubers. And like many others, he's also interested in millets. In, uh, uh, and also, uh, he has been reminding me that next year is the International Year of Quinoa. Uh, so in general, we are very interested in the uh, work that all are involved in to try to uh, support countries and communities as they do work on alternative sources of energy and alternatives to the grain staples. Uh, just sort of like to say uh, at the same time that we see this way of thinking and working as absolutely essential when trying to look at the future of nutritionally uh, uh, nutritionally useful diets and um, this is something that uh, really again our team in FAO are involved in. So thanks very much indeed. Uh, any further thoughts on this issue of moving away from durables is greatly appreciated. Okay, thank you David. Uh, I can see there's a question from Diana. I have a couple of questions and it has to do principally around um, the partnerships we see um, certainly related to the last question in the research community in terms of the investments we're making with some of the uh, CGIR programming and, and other um, emphasis on different kinds of cropping systems and uh, certainly water use, some of those come to mind. And I'd just like a little background on what um, we have with R&D in terms of the Zero Hunger Challenge. And also, um, in terms of the infrastructure investments, which I know go beyond most of the UN agencies and are um, certainly part of the whole formula for increasing smallholder productivity, for principally in water management, um, who is investing in, uh, in sensible irrigation? Um, are these kinds of investors private or donor investors, the World Bank, whoever they may be, are they involved at this Zero Hunger Challenge uh, uh, initiative in a way that we really think we're talking about having all of our ducks in a row? Because when I look at the five uh, challenges and I look at smallholder productivity, sustainable system, um, part of this also has to do with urbanization and food safety, food storage, food processing, um, where are we in terms of this uh, zero hunger challenge and bringing on all of these different uh, entities? So the circle will uh, expand unevenly, I think, between the different stakeholders, Diana. The, uh, the start of trying to get uh, mobilization around this, uh, the Secretary General and Graziano instructed me to focus principally on governments and especially on trying to ensure that we had something that would bring together the G77 governments and the OECD governments. And that was where I concentrated in the interval between May really through to uh, July, going right through Rio plus 20. I was also asked to make sure that uh, two other really influential groups uh, have, were on board. And those were uh, civil society organizations generally, particularly those who are involved in campaigns like Oxfam. And uh, uh, in, in, in addition, uh, he wanted me to work, and I, I think this was really important, with faith groups, uh, um, and particularly those who've got very large congregations. And we did that. We were asked then to work with business, and uh, we sought to get uh, at least some sense that businesses would find this useful to them as they were seeking ways of positioning themselves. Uh, we then brought the UN family in as broadly as we could. And I stress that the World Bank is there and has found itself uh, able, at least at the level of the vice president, um, the vice president responsible for this, to, uh, to take this seriously. Uh, and then uh, we um, are uh, we're particularly pleased with the way in which Mukhtar Diop, the Vice President for Africa, uh, took this uh, very, very much under his wing and saw this as a reasonable way to try to align 
various different investments that his vice presidency is making. But we have not made sufficient inroads into the whole of the CGIAR system. Schengen Fan of IFPRI uh, has been particularly involved, and I work with him within the context of various things in which we're involved together, including the uh, Global Agenda Council on Food Security that's hosted by the World Economic Forum that Schengen is now chair of. And he has fed back into the CGIAR system. But we should do more work to reach out to the whole of the CGR system, uh, and uh, we will indeed be doing that. Uh, I'm particularly working with Rachel Kite in her role as the uh, as one of the main movers in the CGR system on trying to ensure that we do link uh, wherever possible the notion of an action that's along the lines of what's in the Zero Hunger Challenge with different pieces of research endeavor. Um, that, I think that's uh, all I can say on that at the moment. Thank you, Christian. I, 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 ho I hope you don't mind my raising another question here. Um, I mean, I'm looking at it in the sense that NRI is involved in generating knowledge through science to um, support development. Um, I want just to add, actually, but when it comes to roots and tubercots, I'm actually the president of the International Society for Tropical Root Cops, which is the only organization in the world which represents um, all of these crops uh, across the uh, global platform. And I wanted to say something else, actually, which is um, food not eaten. Um, yeah, we might be producing enough food and enough nutritious food, but food not eaten has zero nutritional value. I know that sounds um, sort of obvious, but also um, when you're promoting a, a nutritious product, for example, I'm involved with uh, orange flesh sweet potato, um, which contains vitamin A. Um, again, acceptance is important there. And, and I do think that um, I seem to be one of the few people in Africa who's actually working on consumer acceptance of, of, um, of new foods, and particularly nutritious um, foods. And, you know, what I mean by doing this consumer acceptance, I'm interviewing hundreds of, of people in the studies. And I would like to say from a research point of view that I think this is an under, uh, this, this is a neglected area of um, research looking at um, acceptance. And uh, I'd be interested if people have any views on that one as well, please. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, I mean, I think that uh, this is so important. It'd be great to start a bit of a dialogue on it. I've just been looking quite carefully at the different stakeholders who are increasingly involved, not so much uh, in the Zero Hunger Challenge, but more broadly in the effort to try to bring uh, groups together for an investment in food and nutrition security that brings benefits to smallholders. Um, there, are, there is a need to involve consumers at all levels, consumers when new varieties are, are being introduced, consumers when new forms of processing that perhaps uh, reduce waste and improve a nutritional value are being introduced, consumers when new rules are, and practices are being introduced to increase the sustainability of production systems or to reduce child labor in production, like we've got particularly on cocoa right now consumers when we are working to try to change the way in which animals are being reared in order to yield uh, less um, dangerous forms of uh, animal rearing, such as, for example, better introduction of slaughtering and movement of slaughtered meat, rather than people keeping live animals in their houses and slaughtering them when they need to eat them, which has been uh, one of the issues we've faced with avian influenza. Uh, consumers when we are uh, trying to uh, encourage the development of products that involve less women's time both in preparation and uh, consumption. So bringing in consumers into the discourse as members of multi-stakeholder platforms seems to us to be absolutely critical, not just as a, a research question but also as a policy issue. In the whole area of uh, in, in engaging uh, a business in uh, uh, investments, 
the first area in which we've been trying to enlarge platforms and get more stakeholders involved is by encouraging farmer organization involvement, particularly women farmer organization involvement, which is something we did very much with the World Economic Forum between 2010 and 2012. But our current emphasis is increasingly on seeking ways to engage consumers, particularly in local markets, uh, especially as there is more emphasis on local processing systems or introduction of new varieties. I think, Keith, what you're doing is absolutely critical. And if there's any way in which we can find a way to ensure that uh, uh, our colleagues in the UN system are kept abreast of what you're doing, it would be absolutely great. It's also something that would be excellent to try to perhaps get into the work of the Committee on Food Security. And I shall put this into my CFS hat next time I participate in the advisory group of the CFS, which I think is uh, either November or December. So thanks very much indeed for that. Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, clearly, this is uh, a much-needed challenge for the world. I'm glad to hear that heads of state have been receptive uh, to this challenge. My question is really one of implementation. Um, I see, you know, these five goals as, you know, being aspirational goals, and you know that those won't translate to reality unless there's a clear plan in place to achieve them. So I'd be interested in hearing David's thoughts on how that plan will be rolled out. I'd also be interested to hear his thoughts on how modern technologies will be applied to address these goals. Um, I'm very supportive of Keith's comment around engaging consumers in this because they're clear stakeholders and will be driving the markets that will uh, incentivize smallholder farmers to take up these technologies, including a very broad portfolio of crops to offer balanced nutrition to both urban and, and rural consumers. So, Mine is really a tactical question on implementation and, and how do we use new technology to actually achieve these very noble and important goals, but ones that, based on our Millennium Development Goal experience, uh, are going to be very difficult to achieve. David, thank you very much indeed. Good to see you and hear you. Um, I'd just like to, to give you a little bit of um, thinking from the Office of the Secretary General and uh, people who are advising him right now on this kind of tricky issue of implementation. Uh, here we are now in 2012 and particularly looking ahead. I think that perhaps 10 years ago it was uh, acceptable for those of us working within the international system to see ourselves as uh, acting to take forward global action plans and programs that would have a clear structure for implementation that would be uh, then taken forward by a variety of actors in a fairly hardwired way. You would get a group of people, uh, what I might label A, telling another group of people B uh, how they might like to move ahead and also what kinds of uh, financing would be available to support them, and so on. Uh, really, we've, had realized, we've, I think, come to recognize in a number of different areas that that approach, while immensely successful on relatively straightforward uh, areas of intervention, like, for example, vaccination, uh, just cannot be applied to areas of complex endeavor that require the simultaneous action of a lot of different players who have different reporting lines and different mandates and different incentives for working. And that's led to an increasing focus, of course, on partnerships, some very uh, uh, hard partnerships where there have been, again, memoranda of understanding between different groups, some much softer, which are built around uh, uh, common interests uh, and shared purpose. Uh, I, I feel that we've had some success on, on partnerships. I think in the food security area, the, the Feed the Future partnership, uh, which was taken forward by one government, uh, has been pretty successful. And uh, Purchase for Progress partnership, which looks to link uh, smallholder producers with markets, which has been uh, generously supported by a number of donors. These have been immensely successful uh, in changing the agenda. But even so, 
there's a limit to the extent to which these kinds of partnerships can be taken forward and the transaction costs for setting them up are, uh, are, are quite substantial. And that's led to uh, the current uh, uh, effort where we are seeking always to move forward, but perhaps with much less structured effort by encouraging uh, multiple actors to work in the same direction uh, with common um, monitoring systems, but without hard wiring between them on how they do this work. Uh, term, and increasingly, we're using the term movement to describe that way of working. By the way, I don't think movement is the only way of describing them. There, there are other kind of terms like alliance and so on, but I think most of us know what it is we're talking about with this way of working. Uh, in some ways, it's much harder to uh, to run a movement. In fact, it's a kind of impossible, almost by definition. Nobody runs them. But uh, what uh, we do need to be able to do is to catalyze and facilitate actions that will lead to the different stakeholders working in synergy and achieving results. Now, to implement via movements is also quite tricky because it requires broad ownership for an idea and broad uh, sharing of a set of common principles for working together with a real effort to ensure that people do work in ways that are certainly not harmful and ideally lead to reductions in risk and benefits, uh, long-term benefits for smallholder producers and also for people who are at risk of food insecurity. We've got one such movement approach moving on one of the five pillars the Scale Up Nutrition movement, which was uh, launched in 2010 based on a, a framework for action developed by over 100 different groups, again without any overt ownership from anybody, but shared ownership by many and strong support by a number of governments with adherence from now from 32 countries who are seeking to scale up nutrition with a focus on major reductions, not so far zeroing, but major reductions in level of stunting among children aged less than two years. And this has enormous promise. The progress reported in the last two years is uh, extremely good. And I think that it's one example of where we might go on this. The, the issue of zero loss of waste of food is beginning to evolve. Uh, FAO uh, taking the lead on this with what I hope will develop into a multi-actor movement under the slogan, Save Food. Currently, they've got at least 60 companies signed up to it. Uh, they need to work hard to make sure that there will also be strong uh, ad adherence from civil society groups, and it will take time to move forward. Uh, I think that those are the two examples that I would give straight away. Uh, I think that in order to ensure that these movements work, all of us who work in the public, uh, in international uh, public system and who are bureaucrats like myself have a responsibility to provide the necessary tools and techniques that make a movement take off. And these are metrics that are accessible to and usable by everybody in order to make sure that they are moving in a convergent way. And one of the challenges, therefore, that we face within the high level task force in relation to the zero hunger challenge will be to develop uh, in conjunction with others, of course, metrices that can be used by companies, civil society groups, farmer organization, governments, uh, and others to define whether or not systems are sustainable, and also metrics that can be used to assess whether or not smallholder productivity and income is increasing. On the latter, uh, Bill Gates, when he went to Rome at the end of last year, was extremely explicit, saying that this is something he expected the three agencies based in Rome to work for, and they have taken that forward energetically. The sustainability one is more difficult, and I believe that the challenge that Diana has set us, that we need to be engaging with research actors, is one that perhaps is relevant to the issue of developing the necessary matrix that will lead to movements moving forward on these issues. Now, a movement depends on communication between the actors, and that means making sure that we're making proper use of uh, the technologies that uh, the um, internet give us. And we haven't, I think, done enough on this yet. I'm kind of waiting to see what the energy is like. The fact that we got 
at least four, and we are still combing through the statements to see what they're like, but at least four governments very explicit uh, yesterday on uh, how they see the Zero Hunger Challenge as relevant to their work, Ethiopia, Myanmar, Nigeria, and Brazil, and the fact that we've got 15 countries at least uh, who are now saying very clearly that they are incorporating zero hunger into their national development policies means that we think we're beginning to get the beginnings of a head of steam that would enable us to feel confident that we can start to really get the social media side built up, but we'll need to find some resources to do this, particularly uh, what I said using uh, the website, uh, Twitter and Facebook. Uh, it may be that I need to come to you, David, to get some advice on that. So that's my uh, re reactions to what you've said. That's the elements that I've given you of how we're trying to take it forward. And it fits in with the work that the Secretary General's Office have asked us to do, which is to approach this not so much as a set of goals, but as an overarching vision, which will then stimulate more concerted action by the different actors concerned and the evolution of movements around the zero hunger uh, pillars. Hi, David. Monica from the Secretariat of the Global Donor Platform. Congratulations uh, to your progress made since June at Someone's Psychological Work. I wanted to ask a question on private sector, which you mentioned. Um, we've also seen in the, in the CFS a much more sturdy and interested uh, participation of the private sector mechanism. And uh, you mentioned the contribution, their contribution to sustainable food systems. But you also said a tricky area. I couldn't agree more. Now, the platform is um, currently planning and organizing uh, the next annual general assembly, as you know, at the end of January in The Hague, under the overall title of Food, Farmers and Market. But this is all about private sector and how to relate to them. And so my question is, what is your advice in the preparation? Hey, thanks so much for asking this. And it is an absolutely brilliant opportunity for me to share with you something that we believe is an area on which real work is needed. If we look back over the last three years at the experience that we have seen of efforts to establish multi-stakeholder partnerships that bring together both national and international business and government in order to try to contribute to sustainable uh, uh, food systems that also bring greater benefits to smallholders, there is clearly a body of understanding and learning emerging. One of the key people who's written on this is Charlotte Hildebrand, who's just come in uh, recently to head up the uh, commercial organization that brings together fertilizer manufacturers. I was talking to her recently about this. I said to her that uh, in my judgment, what we need is, is to bring together the uh, analyses and uh, uh, learnings that we have on what kind kind of inputs are necessary to establish the, kind, the partnership arrangements that will lead to sustainable uh, uh, arra the arrangements that do bring sustainability and benefits to smallholders. We both had the opportunity to look at some work that I think Graham Dixie, I got, hope I got his name right, the World Bank has done, looking at the experience of the Commonwealth Development Corporation over 50 years. Uh, if you take that together with some of the other work that Charlotte has analyzed, the following elements seem to be key. Number one, some degree of money in advance of the partnerships coming into place that enables the different stakeholders from governments, from business, and ideally from pharma organizations, together with representations of community groups, when these are different from pharma organizations, to spend time building an understanding of what each other brings to the partnership, an understanding of the principles that they need to put in place for the partnership to work, and an understanding of the kinds of time that is necessary to build the arrangements that will enable the partnership to work. AgDevCo, the group that many of us know that's been working on the Maputo corridor in Mozambique, uh, says that perhaps up to two years advanced investment is needed for such arrangements to actually function in an effective way. 
And business, as we all know, doesn't like that kind of uh, time or cash investment. And perhaps it's not appropriate that business should be making at least the cash investment. And this is where I believe that uh, the donor community has a really, really extraordinary role to play. So what I'd like to happen in your meeting in uh, January is the beginnings of an analysis of what are the key elements that are necessary for these kinds of partnerships to be built in a way that they have the maximum likelihood of bringing benefits to stakeholders and also contributing, uh, in particular, contributing to smallholder well-being, to sustainable agriculture systems, and to benefits for consumers, which might even be capable of being measured in terms of the right to food and nutrition uh, and, and better nutrition. Uh, and I would be very keen to uh, ensure that you can have contact, certainly with all those that we're working with, on this particular issue. It's certainly something that the Grow Africa Partnership that was developed uh, uh, in the last year and a half and is leading to some efforts to build more uh, durable investments with benefits for smallholders in at least five African countries. It's something that they're working on right now. And Arnie Cartridge, who coordinates that work, I think would very much value being involved in such an effort. So that's my quick reaction, uh, Monica. And I hope it, I'm not uh, saying something that is uh, off beam. I have mentioned this to the Dutch government, um, particularly to those within the Dutch government who work on this issue. Uh, and I'm also uh, mentioning it from time to time to other donors as an area that I think needs work that would involve the donor community and perhaps international groups like FAO's investment sector. Then I would like to close the session here and would like to hand over to Maria Lerea, our chair, for some last words of thanks and for farewell. Thank you very much and also thank you for all your participation. I just want to to say a very small comment regarding what already David Navarro mentioned during his introduction on the post-2050 agenda and the, uh, the global consultation that is planned to be organized in Madrid in March. And indeed, Spain is engaged with the food security consultation, thematic consultations, and I think that the, the Zero Hunger Challenge will be a good opportunity to, use, to be used as a basis of, for this discussion. So, um, we really appreciate this, uh, this conference and also the participation of everyone and the, just to, to thank you all of you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, just to say to everybody, uh, it's great to have this conversation. It's very good from our side for us to be uh, focusing our thoughts uh, with you uh, in advance of the conversation as well as during the conversation. And there's plenty of follow-up work to to look at, uh, particularly thinking about the forthcoming meeting of the platform in The Hague, thinking about the work that Keith was, Keith was raising on roots and tubers. Diana's comment, which uh, gives me a real uh, area of focus for tension on the research community. Keith's comments on, uh, on the, uh, the sort of technical side and, and consumers in particular, and then uh, really, some of the points raised by David on implementation and the challenges that we're going to have to explain the approach to implementation when we are very much focusing on, on movements. So this is great, and uh, I look forward to dealing with many of you uh, bilaterally or in other forums. And thank you to Christian for such a great uh, and well-moderated session. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody, for your participation. Thank you, David. Bye-bye.